Hey everybody, let's talk about classifying matter. Uh, particularly because in chemistry we study the behavior of matter. Chemical reactions are the ways in which matter, which is atoms and molecules and stuff that we can interact with, interact with each other when combined. So, if we're going to study how matter behaves, we need to understand the big picture of how we even classify it in the first place. So when we talk about matter, which is the stuff, again, that we study in chemistry, we're talking about anything that has mass and takes up space. That's the quickest, simplest definition. Mass being the measurement of the amount of matter an object contains. So typically we talk about like grams, kilograms, whatever. That tells you how much stuff is there. And then chemistry itself will be defined as the study of matter and the changes that it undergoes. Okay, so we're going to talk about matter. One of the big things we're going to be dealing with is the states of matter. We're going to talk about this a lot throughout the school year. And when we talk about the states of matter, it's really important to understand what that is looking like in the microscopic view. If you zoom in and can see individual molecules or atoms of a solid or liquid or a gas, it is important to understand what's going on in there. So here's where we need to introduce some vocabulary terms to define what we see. And I'm going to put it all up there. Oops, there we go. And let's look at it for a sec because you're going to define everything in terms of definite or indefinite. So notice for solid it says definite shape, definite volume. Think of what definite means. Something that's definite is for sure. Something that's definite is not going to change. So a definite shape is a shape that's not going to change. That is, of course, what a solid is. Same thing for volume. A solid takes up a certain amount of space. You cannot compress it. It stays the same. So it's definite because it isn't going to change. Particles are packed together and cannot move. That doesn't mean they're when I say move, that means like moving from here to here to here. They're vibrating, just vibrating in place. But in terms of moving around, no, they vibrate in place, as in they vibrate in that one location. So moving, but not from point A to point B, but just vibrating in place. Now, liquid, look at how we change the word. Change from definite to indefinite shape. So if definite means like staying the same and not changing, indefinite means able to change. So indefinite shape means that the shape can change. And we know that liquids flow. Water flows. It'll take the shape of whatever container it's in, unlike a solid, which will not take the shape of whatever container it's in. So use indefinite shape to describe the concept of it can change its shape. Whereas definite volume means that you cannot compress a liquid. It stays the same amount. It takes the same amount of space. Even if you squeeze and push on it, it still takes the same amount of space. Um, the particles are packed together but can move freely. That means that just like there's not really any space between the molecules or atoms in a solid, the molecules or atoms, aka the particles in the liquid, there's not really much space between them. They're able to move around, unlike here where they're locked in place. In a liquid, they're able to move around, but there's really no space in between them. So they look the same, except that here they're vibrating in place, here they're vibrating and moving around. Here, unlike these two, indefinite volume means it can be compressed and indefinite shape means it can change its shape. So definite shape, indefinite shape. So shape doesn't change, shape does change, shape does change. These are both indefinite shape. Definite volume, definite volume, indefinite volume. So you cannot compress or expand this. You cannot compress or expand this, but this, yes, can be compressed or expanded because look at all that space between the particles. That means with that space between particles, you can push them closer together or pull them further apart. Unlike these, where they're already in contact with each other pretty much, so what that means is they can't get any closer and they're not going to get any closer. So that's how we use indefinite volume to describe the idea that you can expand or compress gas, and indefinite shape means that it'll change the shape to fit whatever container it's in. Particles spread apart and move quickly. This means that there's space between the particles and they're moving around inside the container. They're moving all over the place. They don't stop unless you freeze it down to negative or zero, absolute zero, the lowest possible temperature. But of course, that would turn into a solid, and that's a whole nother conversation. So, um, other than matter, of course, if it's not matter, we're going to call it energy, which is the ability to do work or cause a change in matter. Work is the act of moving matter from one location to another. So, Energy is the ability to make matter do something. So potential energy is stored energy. This is what makes chemical reactions possible. So potential energy, it's like the energy that's stored inside the bonds of, say, the molecules in gasoline. It's released when you light it on fire. Mixtures. So 
if we go back to matter, matter is stuff that has mass and takes a space. What, what, what kinds of matter are there? Well, if you have different types of matter put together, you have a mixture. And if it's just mixed, we're not talking chemical reaction, we're just mixing two things together, maybe like sand and salt or something like that, or sand and water. Um, they're physically mixed, you could separate them using by physical means, as in you could filter water out of sand or separate uh, salt and sand or something like that. Um, but other examples would be even like macroscopic stuff that you might not think of as a chemical solution, like chicken noodle soup is a mixture of different types of matter all put together. They haven't chemically reacted. You're not going to get a chemical reaction between the noodle and the water, but nonetheless, it's all mixed together, and that's the concept of what a mixture is. So if there's other ones. There's another one. Yes, air is nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide, and then some trace gases like argon and whatnot, but these are all mixtures where the things haven't reacted with each other. They exist separately, but they are all mixed together, or they exist as individual molecules, but they're mixed together. Um, types of mixtures. Now, there's some mixtures that are heterogeneous, and hetero means different because it's not evenly mixed, and so depending on where you look, you might see different things. So if you look here, you might see ice cube. If you look here, you might see tea. If you look here, you see lemon. This is a heterogeneous mixture because it's not evenly mixed. Put this in a blender, and then you'll have a much more homogeneous mixture, which is homogeneous being the opposite of this. So if you want to make this not heterogeneous, put it in a blender. Uh, Oil and vinegar, even a blender won't quite fix that, but the idea that they don't mix evenly, so depending on where you look, you see different things. That's why we use hetero, which means different, to describe it. Salad, same thing, different stuff. Homogeneous mixture means evenly mixed, which means no matter where you look at it, you see the exact same thing. So Kool-Aid, no matter where you look in here, you see a mixture of water and Kool-Aid mix. Water contains all kinds of dissolved minerals, dissolved gases and stuff, and no matter where you look, you're going to see exactly the same thing, at least in the water portion of it. And then stainless steel is a mixture of iron, carbon, uh, depending on what kind of stainless steel, it might contain chrome or manganese or other stuff. Um, and it likewise will be very evenly mixed so that no matter where you look, you're going to see roughly the same mixture of atoms. So that's a homogeneous mixture, homo meaning the same, because no matter where you look, you see the same thing. So. Heterogeneous mixture, depending on where you look, you might see different things. Homogeneous mixture, no matter where you look, you're going to see roughly the same mix of atoms. So that's mixtures, and then if you're going to separate them, this is one of the big things we do in chemistry, you need to exploit differences in physical properties. More about that in future notes. But for now, when we talk about physical properties, this is things like its boiling point or its size or things like that. We can take advantage of that to separate different substances. So we want you to be familiar with what are the different ways that you can separate a mixture of substances because that's one of the big things chemists do. Um, so filtration is the quickest, easiest one. Using a porous barrier to separate a solid from a liquid. A porous barrier. Porous means able to pass through. So this basically means a filter. Like maybe a cloth filter. Think like a coffee maker, right? The paper coffee filter that catches the coffee grounds. Uh, it's that idea of using something like that, a barrier that lets some things pass through but not others. As in, maybe it lets the liquid pass through but not the solid. So that's an example. Filtration is one way to separate mixtures. Of course, you want students to be aware of what filtration is. And the vocabulary used, a porous barrier, is what we mean to say filter, uh, to separate things from another. So the, vo so the vocabulary used to describe the tools that we use. So, uh, okay, yeah, you know, that's a filter. It separates the pasta from the water, or there's the coffee mixture I was telling you about, or the coffee filter. Um, distillation is another technique, and this is something you may have heard in reference to like the production of alcoholic beverages. It's also used in water purification and other, and other things. A technique that can be used to physically separate most homogeneous mixtures based on differences in boiling point of the substances involved. So here's what distillation is. Distillation is you take something and you heat it up, and maybe something evaporates much more easily than the other thing. Like for example, salt water. Water evaporates at 100 degrees Celsius, or it boils at 100 degrees Celsius, and then salt boils at like, I don't know, like 1,000 degrees Celsius, or 1,500 degrees Celsius, or something like that. So there's a huge difference in boiling points, which means that you can heat the water up, collect just the water vapor, cool it down, and condense it to make pure water with no salt in it. That's distilled water. 
So that's an example of distillation applied to salt water. You can do this with a wide variety of substances. Um, in case of liquor, it's a mixture of stuff that contains alcohol. Alcohol evaporates more easily than water, so they heat it up, the alcohol evaporates off, and then you cool the alcohol vapor down and you get much purer alcohol. So the idea of distillation is heat it up, collect the vapor, cool the vapor down to get a pure sample of whatever it is you're collecting. So chromatography is another one. So a technique that is used to physically separate the components of a mixture based on the tendency of each, compo each component to travel or be drawn across the surface of another material. Fancy talk for take a special surface like a chromatography paper or there's some other surfaces we use too, but chrome paper is the most common. And then you can take a substance that's a mixture of things like, for example, ink, and then as the alcohol or whatever solution soaks upward, it carries that ink with it, but the bigger molecules don't go as far as the small molecules, and so it separates them out. And it takes what looks like just black ink and separates it into the colors that it actually contains, blue and red and yellow. And so this is an example of chromatography is as something soaks upward, it carries some of the components in different ways and therefore separates them out. So um, that's the idea of how you separate substances to make pure substances. So if you get a type of substance by itself, we call it a pure substance. Now, for pure substances, if you get a pure material of some kind, it's either an element, which means it contains only one type of atom, maybe just iron atoms or just gold atoms or just oxygen atoms and nothing and no other types of atoms present. Or if there's two or more types of atoms, we call it a compound. Again, two or more types of atoms. So what that means is that you might have something like, oh, let me grab a pen to make a point here. You might have something like gold, which is just Au, that's one type of atom. You might have oxygen, which has this formula, that's two atoms, but because it's only one type of atom, it's still a pure element, whereas a compound might be like CO2 because it has two types of atoms, or H2O because it has, I should say, more than two or more types of atoms present, or CH3OH, which is a compound called methanol, that's three types of atoms, whatever. It's two or more types of atoms, that makes it a compound. All right, so that's a rough picture of element versus compound, which are two very important terms that we're going to be using a lot this year. And then, of course, looking at this, you should be able to tell which ones are the pure substances and which ones are the elements, which ones are the compounds as well. So, pure substances. Actually, I will ask you, the viewer, that. Can you tell which ones of these is a pure substance? And you can pick one of these, or you can pick more than one of these. Go ahead and pick which one's the pure substance. All right, if you chose correctly, a pure substance is, let's see, does it have, okay, there we go. So, all right, so it doesn't have it. I'll point it out. This is a pure substance. Sorry, this is not a pure substance because there's more than one kind of thing present. So this is not a pure substance. This is a pure substance because there's only one kind of thing present. This is also a pure substance because there is more than one kind of thing present. Now, the next question, I'm going to, because this is not a pure substance, a mixture, I'm going to cross this out. I want you to look just at these two. Can you tell which one's the element, which one's the compound? Go ahead and state now B and C, which one's the element, which one's the compound? All right, if you're correct, then you chose B as the element, because there's only one kind of atom, and you chose C as the compound, because there's two kinds of atoms. I should say two or more types of atoms present. All right, so that gives a rough idea of how that goes. Now, uh, let's move along to the last little bits here. An element, which again is only one type of atom present, um, is the simplest form of matter that has its own unique set of properties. Uh, you can't easily break an atom down into anything smaller. I mean, you can using a particle accelerator or a nuclear explosion, but that's about what it takes. So you can separate atoms into simpler things, however, not easily. So under normal natural conditions, we just say atoms cannot be broken down. I mean, that's why the Greeks called them atoms, because atom means uncuttable in Greek. So the 
thing about these atoms is each element has its own symbol. You'll find it on the periodic table of elements. If it's not on the periodic table of elements, it's not an element. Like, for example, water is not on the periodic table of elements because it's made of different kinds of atoms stuck together. So uh, there is examples, and it points out again, if you have two of the same kind of atom, that's still one type of atom, which makes it a pure element. So compound, a substance that contains two or more elements, can, can be combined in a fixed proportion. I need to make it clear, two or more types of elements, because you can have two elements, but it's still a, an element, because it's only one type of atom. So you can have a total of more than one atom, but if you have more than one type of atom, it's a compound. So properties are different from the individual elements. What this means is, like, consider, for example, glucose is made out of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. If you take carbon by itself, it's a black tasteless solid. Oxygen by itself is a colorless tasteless gas. Hydrogen by itself is a colorless tasteless gas, also highly flammable. Uh, whereas these are actually, I guess, somewhat flammable. But um, the point is, like, a sweet white solid looks nothing like the behavior of the individual elements that it's made out of. So the behavior of a compound has little to do with the properties of the things that it's composed of. Uh, there's other examples of compounds. Pyro contains iron and sulfur, and yet it not, looks like neither one in its pure form. Or cinnabar is mercury and sulfur, and yet it looks like neither mercury nor sulfur. It looks completely different and unique from the other two. Um, if you're going to break down a compound, then physical methods don't work. Physical methods being like filtering it or hitting with a hammer or stuff like that is not going to break sugar down into pure hydrogen, pure oxygen, pure carbon. You need to use chemical changes to force that to happen. So chemical changes, i.e. chemical reactions that disassemble or assemble molecules or atoms or molecules at the individual atomic level. So this is the big picture thing of substances versus mixtures. There's matter. It's either pure substances or a mixture. If it's a pure substance, it's either an element or a compound, depending on whether it's one type of atom or more than one type of atom. If it's a mixture, then it's either homogeneous, which means evenly mixed, or heterogeneous, which means unevenly mixed. And that kind of gives the big idea of it. Now, it, it may vary from year to year, but in most years we typically give a quiz over it. So these are the things that you want to make sure that you are aware of and able to do. You can read this. Make sure to be aware of the things that you've been told about here. And well, that about takes care of that. Happy studies.